Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for an exciting and interactive huddle session. My name is Rashesh Doshi, and I'm the Managing Director at Talent Corner HR Services Private Limited, and an Ascent member of the Illuminati Trust Group for the last seven years, and now the Mix Bag Trust Group, which is the All India Trust Group. It's my pleasure to moderate this exciting huddle session on ways to encourage teamwork and collaboration amongst employees today. Let me begin by introducing our esteemed guests and speakers today. Our first speaker for the day is our very own Harsh Mariwala, who we all know is the chairman of Marico Limited and the founder of Ascent. He's also now the author of a book, Harsh Realities, The Making of Marico, which those of us who read it know it's a very inspiring book. Welcome, Harsh, and it's always a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Our second speaker today, uh, Esther, who will be joining us shortly, is the CEO and Editor-in-Chief at People Matters. People Matters is a niche media brand which, encouraged, which engages with top businesses and HR leaders. It enriches the way HR technology and talent management practices contribute to the business growth and success. Welcome, Esther. And our third speaker today is Rajesh Nair, Executive President and CHRO at Polycab India Limited. He has been associated with Tata Motors for more than 28 years and head HR of commercial vehicles, sales, customer care, and talent acquisition. Welcome, Rajesh. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, the way I like to do the session is, you know, keep it more like a conversation. Uh, we would love you to share experiences and examples. And obviously, if any of you would like to cross-question each other and get some more dope, we'd be more than happy to have so. And uh, we've got a couple of dozen questions from our you know, participants today. Uh, I've bucketed them into different uh, you know, verticals and I'll go, us, go on as for the verticals. So um, firstly, I'd like to start you know, with, with a very interesting vertical around goal and strategy. Um, and this question goes to both of you. Uh, we all set goals, we all you know, build strategies and a lot of decisions are taking at the, at the senior management level. How do you make sure that every single person in the pyramid, top to bottom, okay, gets the same information, is very clear, and you know everybody is aligned towards the goal, strategies, and decisions? So I'm going to start with Rajesh first, and then Harsh can also contribute. Uh, thanks, Rajesh. Uh, in my experience, uh, and I will talk related to largely experience. Uh, you know, there is a core team, there is a strategy team or the senior leadership team uh, at the top of the organization. It could be, it could be a team of leaders of uh, very heading various functions or in a small unit, it could be just one or two people or depending upon how you define leadership, somebody who has the vision to see beyond the current year in terms of what the organization is going to do from a business point of view, and therefore from a people's perspective, systems perspective, process perspective, what is it that we are planning to do for the next uh, five years? And then of course, if you're planning for the immediate year, one year at least, in terms of uh, what are we planning to achieve in terms of business objectives, which could be financial and non-financial. Once the top team is very clear and very aligned that this is what we are going to do and how each function is going to correlate or relate to the other function in order to make this achievable, uh, the task then is, uh, is a cascade and breaking down that big goal into smaller chunks, smaller biteable pieces, right till the last person in the organization. So effectively, it means that uh, if to give you an example, 100 gets broken down into units of ones, twos, and fives when it reaches the last person. Every person in the chain has, an, has a very clear visibility of how his achieving his goals translates into achieving the organization achieving goals that's very simplistically put but i think that is what the whole objective of a goal cascade or a strategy cascade should be if you want to if you want to ensure that the goal reaches the last person communication should be extremely clear communication should be very very open uh, nothing hidden i mean this is what the goals for the organization are except maybe for some financial parameters which are sensitive information Everything else should be completely visible, frequently communicated to the entire team, co-created with the team right till the last person and who finds there is enough linkage and enough substance is what he is doing to the goals right at the top uh, till the chairman, till the chairperson. So that is very simplistically put how it, we can uh, try and achieve this. Uh, 
Rashish, I think your audio is off. Yeah, sorry, they got muted by the host. Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks, Rajesh. Uh, Harsh, your viewpoints on this? Yeah, I think to some extent, uh, Rajesh has covered it. The question of alignment, you know. So normally, I will uh, tell you what we do in Americo. So we don't share a three-year vision with all our employees. We mainly share uh, the next year. So the, uh, the what we call our trust areas for the organization. So there are organizational trust areas and there are functional trust areas and there are locational trust areas. So for example, the uh, organization, mostly four trust areas are, are maximum four or five in so it'll, uh, for the organizational trust area, it'll be what is, what do we want to be our top line growth, bottom line growth? What are the new key initiatives we are going to undertake, which are very relevant for the organization? So that gets decided by the top management team. And um, it's also presented to the board. And after doing all that, it gets shared with, uh, we have town hall events uh, in, in uh, after our first, last quarter results are declared sometime in April end. So we share the organizational trust areas with all our employees. So they get an overall picture in terms of what exactly uh, the organization is headed towards. Uh, there is some degree of danger, I may call it, I won't call it danger, but the risk that, okay, some of it may leak out to competition. But we strongly believe that except for new product launches and uh, something which is uh, more a development, product development, R&D issue, we should share everything. So we have decided to take that risk because then it is the positive side is people feel involved. They know exactly where the organization is headed towards. So uh, what happens is at the larger event, we share the organizational trust areas. And then there are events, town hall events held at each location and at each region. For example, if I have a factory in, in Gujarat, then the Gujarat factory will have, uh, they will share first what the organizational trust areas. <laughs> and then for each factory, each function, it gets broken down, you know. So what is that functions? For example, the sales functions, trust areas. Uh, suppose if North region is growing and the North would say, okay, we want to grow this, this, this. And then that gets shared with that location. Similarly, at it, bro it gets broken down at the state level also. So it's actually starting from the top and it gets filtered down uh, at lower levels in their sphere of influence, wherever they're operating, whether it's a factory or whether it's a sales region. And that shared openly. And I think that gives an overall picture to each individual that, okay, what is the organization like you to do? What is that function like you do? And what am I supposed to do in that particular uh, location or in that particular branch? So there is a lot of cascade which goes on. And there is a build up to the cascade from the bottom, which ultimately uh, gets culminated in the, in the organization trust area. So, and then we have an open house also with that. So if somebody is not clear, about trust areas, then uh, they can ask those questions. Why this? Why this much stretch? So it's a little, it's more of a top-down exercise where the top at least gives the overall picture uh, in terms of what's going to happen, what is likely to happen for the organization. Um, but in the build-up to the top, a lot of a lot of input may have been taken from people down the line. I don't know whether that made makes sense, but you know it's. It's a structured exercise at a certain point in time, sometime April end or May beginning, which gets culminated through sharing openly uh, and giving overall picture as well as the picture broken down in a little bit, shall I say, at a functional level, location level. Yep. And uh, Rashesh, one more yep. point. Uh, it finally culminates into individual goal setting as a part of the PMS process. Uh, wherein uh, it, it finally gets, you know, hard-coded into a goal sheet of an individual, which of course gets uh, discussed between the individual and his manager, but this is aligned to what has been communicated earlier, which Harsh has been speaking about also. The okay. whole objective of that is to enable an individual to suggest the goals which that person would take. Fair enough. So, you know, Rajesh, interestingly, you mentioned, uh, you know, something that was one of the questions in the in the dashboard, which is uh, the individual goals, right? So there's a question which came in saying, how do you actually help someone to build an individual goal and how do you help them assess it properly? Any any experiences on that? See, I, I believe very strongly in goal cascade, okay? Because uh, organizational goals need to go, lead to individual goals. And uh, 
one of the uh, sanity checks that you can do is, uh, are you doing something frivolent or are you doing an activity which does not feed into an organizational objective? I mean, that's a goal check that you need to do or a goal audit that you need to do to ensure that what you're doing is actually something which the organization needs. So it's, it's usually done very effectively between the manager and the subordinate, wherein the manager says, if I have to achieve one, two, three, four, five, my subordinate needs to achieve 1.1, 2.1, 3.1, and so on. Because if there is no, if that kind of an alignment is not there, uh, for example, typically, if you let's give me an example of a sales guy, let's say somebody who's looking after Maharashtra market and has a revenue uh, target, a profitability target, and a product mix target, if he doesn't really break it down to the 10 guys who are reporting to him, there's no way that this guy is going to achieve the goals because he's not going to directly, he's going to control, monitor, ensure that there are no misses. But it is the guys below him who are actually delivering on from individual markets of Bombay, Nagpur, Dole, et cetera, et cetera. So that needs to feed in and uh, go up and culminate into the manager's goal. So if the manager and the guy below, they need to align. They need to have a very good conversation once the vision strategy for the year, the objectives for the year are cascaded. Every manager needs to sit with his team or his subordinate and say, are your goals aligned to what we want to achieve as a team? So that alignment is extremely, extremely crucial. And there is this goal audit, which needs to happen, wherein you're saying that, fine, the organization has 10 goals of various kinds. Are we ensuring that all those 10 goals are cascaded? Or are we missing out someone? Because very often what I've seen is that eight out of those 10 goals are very clearly, which are very fat goals, which are visible, very easily cascaded down. Two of them, sometimes you end up saying, seeing that it is not really there. People down below are not executing. And we realize that after some time, when probably one quarter is over, suddenly we find that on two of the parameters, we are struggling. So very often there is this goal alignment that needs to be done. And at the beginning of the year, let's say in April, once the uh, uh, vision and uh, the strategy, the objective is very clearly communicated in an open forum, the managers need to sit with their team members to align this. It's a, it's a discussion which needs to happen. And there is a buy-in and a push and a shove, which needs to happen because managers will push for higher numbers, higher objectives. And the uh, ground level situation is something which the uh, guy at the bottom will communicate to the uh, manager and say that this is what is realistically possible, but how do we still align to what the company objectives are? Harsh, there's also a saying that, you know, goals needs to be communicated. You mentioned that. Do you over communicate your goals? How often do you communicate your goals? Uh, in your organization? So uh, I think I just continuing from what uh, Rajesh was saying, you know, I think what we do is we give a overall picture and I think ultimately it should all add up in the sense that, you know, bottom up, each person's goal should ultimately lead to the organizational trust area, the, whatever the organization is, is set to achieve, but everybody is not likely to achieve the goal. So the net result of all the goal addition should be a bit higher than what the organizational goals are because everybody will not achieve the goals and it's it's not right to expect that everybody will achieve all the goals, you know. So the process, at least at our end, is that, okay, the boss, the person proposes the goals, you know. The starting point is that each person proposes the goal, but the boss also has something in, in the mind, in the sense that, okay, that this person should take this much stretch. And then after listening to the person who's proposing, then the goals are finalized. So there is some degree of, shall I say, dialogue and it is just not thrust down to an individual because ultimately that person has to own it. So it's very important to convince the person that, you know, you, I mean, you propose the goal and if you're not taking the right degree of stretch, then I will try and convince you to increase the stretch. But that dialogue is very important, you know, because ultimately the goals have to be owned and the whole objective of goal setting is to, to motivate an individual, you know, many times we think that it is to punish an individual. Uh, we think that it is to actually get variable pay. Yes, variable pay is connected to the achieving goal sheet, but the objective is to set goals which are achievable and which will motivate. Because if you put the goals at very very high, where a person may just not be able to achieve those goals, they will just give up, you know. So you don't want to be in a situation where people give up halfway because the goals have a very, very high degree of stretch. So considering that we also have a goal review, a structured review at the end of six months, a lot of it has to do with the environment. For example, nobody could have predicted pandemic happening. So if 
what are the likely implications of that so if need be the gold sheet can be changed you know it's not uh, cast in stone because the environment uh, external environment which is beyond anybody's control can change and that can have an impact on the organization's future uh, what was your question i i think have i covered everything or there was just a question that we had which is around communicating the goals how often or should we over communicate goals no not I mean, each person should have his own goal sheet so i mean, we don't need to communicate to the communication is between the boss and the subordinate you know and uh, as rajesh was saying we also do a goal audit because sometimes you know because there is high variable pay depending again on the level you know so some some boss could misuse that system you know in the sense that they may not uh, have high degree of stretch or somebody may have very high degree of stretch so the hr function uh, a team of one or two individuals who have a little bit of more business knowledge they actually audit the goal and then you know go back to the organization wherever somebody has not fixed the right degree of stretch some boss so i think that also is done but communication is actually it's it's a dialogue between the boss and the and the subordinate and you know the dialogue can happen at any frequency depending on how that person is doing increasingly is getting more and more concurrent in, in the sense that people are are doing reviews on a on a far more higher frequency these days rather than only at the end of the year because you want to know the so objective is to make that perform that person perform better and motivate that person so, so rashi yeah. it's it's more the progress on the goals which is reviewed not really the goals uh, goals to ek bar ho gaya that is done but the progress is monitored very very frequently and every organization will have a different system or different uh, uh, periodicity uh, it's it's usually uh, uh, twice a month or once a month at least is something which we would recommend uh, in a in a business scenario which is highly volatile it could be even more uh, frequently fair fair i think that covers the question uh, i'm going to move on to the cultural aspect of the organization um uh, how does one foster and this is a very general question how does one foster the whole aspect of teamwork engagement ownership and accountability in an organization i think a lot of mid size organization face this challenge about ensuring this culture of uh, you know ownership and accountability is there uh, so your experiences and your thoughts around that we'll start with you harsh so i think you know it's very important to involve people to get their commitment you know if i tell you as a boss that please do this this is what you should be doing without involving you then you will not feel committed i have a very strong view point that involvement is very crucial in key organizational initiatives whether it's goal setting or culture building or so you have to involve people in goal setting and you have to make them understand that why you set a certain degree of goal then only you will get a commitment and what how can i help you in in achieving goals so the whole objective starting point is that goal setting is has to be a motivator that's the biggest uh, i think each boss should realize that i am setting goals to motivate you and how do i help you achieve those goals is my job and then involve them in terms of getting their feedback uh, asking them to propose dialogue with them rather than a uh, top such down kind of a number which the boss decides you know yep. rajesh your thoughts around this the question is more around how to get everybody accountable towards their roles or you know take yes. more ownership around it i think uh, accountability comes with empowerment also you know um, how open an organization and it's all about culture frankly it's it's not something which can be done overnight uh, it's about uh, the leaders right at the top walking the talk if if the if if the organization sees the leaders at the top taking accountability responsibility uh, and are diligent towards uh, what is needs to be delivered i think everybody will fall in line it's it's a, it's the messaging and these are cultural cues which have to emanate right from the top uh, we cannot expect the uh, the tail to wag the dog it has to be the other way around you know so if the leaders display behaviors of accountability and of course once they are empowered they are given that flexibility the wherewithal to do the resources to do what they want to do and then you hold them accountable responsible for the actions and then fine the entire organization i think will look at each other and realize that this is what the what this is how we are supposed to behave in this particular organization also i think uh, 
uh, with accountability also comes a certain element of uh, risk which an organization needs to take because an organization cannot be successful in all its initiatives. All the product launches of every organization are never a success. There'll be some amount of success, some amount of failures. An organization need to permit failures because if you, if you, if you trust your team, trust your team to make mistakes and learn from them, I think that is how you build accountability, responsibility, because the person learns something new every time he commits a mistake. And that is so very critical in any organization. And what this, this, I think, to a certain extent, builds the environment of acceptability, uh, responsibility. He's, he's responsible both for his successes and failures. And he learns each time from each success story and failure story. And this is a sort of uh, culture building, if I can call it that, which happens right in the front of a lot of people in the organization. And therefore, the people lower down, they see what is happening and learn. Because the best way to teach something is basically to behave and ask people to pick up cues rather than telling them what to do let the leaders walk the talk and let the let the others rest of the organization pick cues from them i believe that is very very crucial and in your journey rajesh have you seen uh, right now with the whole work at home scenario and the covid situation a lot of organizations are finding the engagement levels of team members low uh, how have you work towards in ensuring that your teams are engaged and they are working as a team together? Uh, see, as far as, uh, you know, I have two experiences to narrate. When I was in Tata Motors, for example, we were literally shut for about uh, 15 months, uh, completely operating from home. And uh, But what happened during COVID is uh, the uh, online engagement through teams increased so dramatically uh, you know, which was unbelievable. So the quantum of work that everybody put in actually was much more. But one of the uh, side effects of that, if I can put it from my personal observation is uh, your casual coffee, uh, you know, coffee uh, uh, table conversations or water cooler conversations ceased because what happened was all your conversations with MS teams became completely formal and completely work related and completely to the point which to a certain extent, in my view, curbs uh, creativity, curbs uh, that openness or uh, the engagement piece, if you can call it that. So during the COVID uh, period, uh, we tried engaging in non-serious discussions intentionally, uh, trying to do something which is not really got to do with business directly, but more as uh, coming together, trying to create a, a, a coffee room kind of an atmosphere intentionally I don't think it was very successful, but that is an attempt made. But once now that the COVID is, uh, you know, it's probably uh, a touch wood, it's, it's uh, towards the end of the COVID uh, uh, wave, as we can call it, most organizations are opening up. But even otherwise, I don't think many organizations will completely shift to a 100% work from office kind of a scenario. Uh, I believe that some physical engagement is required, maybe once a week, twice a week, depending upon the kind of population that you have. Uh, we are human beings and I would uh, not agree with uh, the thought that we can completely work out of home permanently. Uh, so that, that I believe has implications both in terms of engagement and how much you feel attached to an organization. Work will continue to happen. I think productivity figures rose during COVID times. There's people worked extra time during COVID times. All that was very, very clear. But I think uh, there is a burnout that happens. And, uh, and, and a people to people contact is something which is absolutely, absolutely required beyond a certain point in time to build the kind of engagement and the attachment to an organization. At least that's my belief. Harsh, would you like to add on something? Yeah, I, uh, you know, in our case in Marico, what happened was the lockdown was uh, announced and because we are an essential products, we, we were allowed to start our factory as soon as possible. And we were able to start our factories within days and the investments we made, which we had made in, uh, in the technology, everybody having a laptop at home, <clears throat> then uh, all the culture building in terms of empowerment, uh, boundarylessness, openness, trust played a huge role in ensuring that the work happened on its own. And, you know, normally in many organizations where there is a top-down kind of leader, uh, a lot of things comes out of the leader here because we are an empowered organization. People were able to work on their own. So culture played a very, very important role in, in, 
in driving overall, I would say teamwork, engagement, people were absolutely charged. And we did exceedingly well uh, in that period in terms of supply chain. You were the first factories in the FMCG to, to do that. And not only just like starting the factory, but you know we had problems that distributors and many of the distributors were shut, uh, CNF agents were shut, so retailers were shut. So we had taken multiple initiatives in terms of apps where we could supply directly to the retailers. We had also apps for consumers where uh, if you were staying in a housing society in a big city, then you would supply directly. So, so the whole supply chain was a big challenge and I think that was uh, handled extremely well. And in addition to that, we also saw lots and lots of opportunities in terms of new product development and uh, launching new products. And virtually we launched so many new products, uh, most of them sitting at home except uh, some R&D team. So we launched products like Honey, Chavan Prash, even uh, Veggie Wash, which is there to wash uh, vegetables and fruits. Uh, so I think all in all, it really motivated people and HR played a very important role in ensuring that uh, they use this opportunity to reach out to family members because everybody was at home during the lockdown and we actually use that opportunity to virtually have every day something or the other for the family to benefit from whether it's a hobby class or whether it's a Zumba class or whether it's art or culture or music or or how do you mitigate stress or mental health? Because everybody was sitting at home and everybody was anxious, stressed. Uh, so the MD would uh, at least have one, once a month a town hall kind of a situation where they would, where he would speak to everybody because this is uncertain time and one didn't know what, uh, what to do. And then in addition to that, we ensured that whoever got infected, we put them into hospitals, ventilators, oxygens, uh, and then vaccinations. So, it has been a great opportunity to become far more closer to not only to our members, but to, to our, their families and show them values of uh, empathy, caring. Uh, and I think that those values, the scores have gone up substantially. Our engagement rates have, have beaten global indices in terms of what are the engagement rates and they continue to be high. So we saw this big, big, shall I say, crisis uh, in terms of improving our overall way of working and partly because of culture and partly because of some of the, many of the initiatives which HR took to, to be closer to our members and, and their families. Great. I think the HRs deserve a pat on their back for the work done during this particular period. Uh, we've also got Esther with us. Esther, uh, welcome. Um, we were talking a lot about uh, the engagement of teams, Esther, and we would love your experience in terms of how do you engage teams and get them to work together. Thank you so much. So I think just to add to a harsh and Rajesh's point on engagement in the context of the post pandemic, I think it is a big challenge for uh, organizations that have chosen to be more hybrid. And I would agree with Rajesh that there is a need for a, a physical connect. Uh, but, uh, but our position has been that we come to office when we need to do something that requires to come to office because we want to avoid there's a little bit of uh, too much of working from home in office, which is something that, you know, finally it doesn't, it, it doesn't add up to neither the, the organizational needs nor the, nor the teams. Um, so the engagement has been a bigger challenge. I think people want to work from home. They want to have the flexibility. And there are two challenges to that. One is the discipline to be able to really take care of, you know, your, your work and your life. I think there's a new skill that we all had to learn in the last 12 months, 18 months of how do you manage yourself? How do you manage your own time? How do you create boundaries? How do you uh, disconnect? I think we had a physical disconnect when we were going to a physical space and we knew what was work and what was life. And in the last 18 months, we all had to learn and I think many of us haven't learned it fully. Um, and, and that's a challenge. Challenge of each one of us as leaders to really play that role of a coach and help people say, okay, I think it's time for you to, you know, take a break or don't work on weekends, don't work in the evenings. And I think many of us are entrepreneurs and we have teams that are highly engaged, highly motivated. And I think that's fantastic. We all work very long hours as well, but that's, that has a connection with this engagement. If we don't create spaces to disconnect, we don't create spaces for people to recharge. Um, it, it is not, it's, it's a big challenge that we need to address before it's late. 
and not only for ourselves, but for our teams as well. So that's one challenge from engagement perspective. This, and we, we try to overcome that by several things. One is, of course, the discipline of taking leaves. I think it's such a small thing, but such an important thing, especially if your teams are small, people tend not to take leave. And I think it's important that we enforce, that we plan for leaves and people take leaves. One people, once people are on leave, it becomes even more important that we don't disturb people while they're on leave. Because right now we are not in the same physical space, so we don't even remember that maybe Rajesh is on leave or you know, uh, Ruchika is on leave. And I think it's even more important to have the discipline to, to be aware if somebody's on leave and don't disturb. So the leave policy, we don't even have a policy. You can take leaves in, in people matters when you need them. You just need to plan them and work with your team. So that becomes even more challenging because if you don't have a leave policy, people tend to actually not take so many leaves. So that's one thing that I'm enforcing personally. So taking breaks, taking leave, we set up a Wednesday with no meetings, having the discipline to follow that. Um, so I think this, this taking off is one very important component of engagement. We seem to think that doing more things for people are going to engage them more. Sometimes we just need to create that space to disconnect, to really, really engage uh, people. The second challenge that I'm, I'm seeing is, um, you know, that need, as Rajesh was saying, the need to, to be physically together at some intervals. I think that creates a huge disengagement. Because if I'm working from home, um, I could be working for People Matters or I could be working for any organization. No? And that's where harshest point on culture is so important. But culture also needs that physical connect. Now, the way we have done it is we have not uh, set up any, um, you know, you come to office one a day or twice a week or, you know, Mondays and Tuesdays because we, we don't want to do the tick in the box approach to return to work, but we're setting up reasons for people to come to office. So for example, our training programs are all, um, not all, but all the programs that we believe are going to benefit if there is a physical component because it, it's a group training. So we're doing them in office. Uh, anything that we do our Friday um, meeting with the managers, we're doing it in office. So then people can come together at that space. So we're trying to design meetings, trainings, and engagement opportunities that require people to come to a physical space. So I think these are the two dangers of engagement. One is the, the not giving enough time off. Uh, and then the second is the designing intentionally those physical spaces for people to connect. Great. Thanks, Esther. There's a very interesting question uh, out here. Uh, and Hush, I'd like you to, to answer it. So um, the question is that, you know, India is obviously very diverse and people from different cultures and different mindsets. How do you get people from such diversity to work together as a team? So I think one is in India, I though you know, we have people coming in from different states and there is some degree of diversity in terms of uh, their thinking, but we have not really found that as a challenge, you know, that to integrate uh, people from, from different parts of the country to integrate them in a common culture. Um, partly because, you know, we recruit a lot of youngsters and our average age is also very, very young. And our uh, talent pool comprises of new talent which comes in almost at an entry level. So they are not, shall I say, they're not conditioned by, by a certain culture which uh, over a period of time they have got into, you know, which could be dictated by or which could have got influenced by some geographical kind of a presence. For example, they say in Delhi everything works through influence or they say in Calcutta everything works slowly. Uh, but we have taken people of different communities uh, and we have not seen that much variation partly because we take people at a young age and then mold them into our own culture. But the problem would arise a little bit more when you go out of India because each country also has a different culture. And when you go into a new country through an acquisition or through an organic route, then uh, 
one has to look at that country culture. For example, in a, in a country like Vietnam, people don't open up, they don't give feedback. Uh, so, I mean, one has to reconcile what are the limitations which this culture brings about in that particular country and try and change it over a period of time. Any change like this may take some time, but one has to go on trying uh, and try and integrate the organizational culture at a corporate office with the country culture, which could be different. It may take a little longer to, to implement, but we have not seen, as I said earlier, I have not seen so much of a challenge in integrating culture within India. Okay. Esther, Rajesh, any thoughts from your side? Esther? Yeah, happy to comment. So we, um, during the pandemic, we went, as I was sharing, uh, we went full remote and we took the opportunity to, to also increase the hiring that we did outside of India because People Matters aspiration was always to be a global brand. And we took the opportunity to, to, to really think of our business fully digital and hence hiring people from, as Harsh was saying, not only the diversity of India, but also people outside of India. And, and it does need adapting that culture because we've hired people in, uh, in, in Europe, we've hired people in Latin America, and it, it's necessitated a huge um, adaptation journey for everyone because culture does play a very different role. And I think at the end of the day, it's always about the foundation of trust and the foundation of uh, alignment of the common goal. So I think I always look when I hire people, I always look of how, how do they feel about the passion that you know, we have about what we want to achieve, our community. Why do they want to join us? And I think the why uh, is what creates the channel for communication. And there are a lot of challenges. There are challenges of misunderstanding. There are challenges of communication. There are challenges of you know, people perceiving something, but experiencing something else, especially in a remote context. You know, it becomes a lot more difficult. And many of you have hired uh, leaders through during the process, during the pandemic and you haven't some of them you haven't even met physically so imagine how difficult it is to build trust and relationships when you don't have that opportunity to build that physical um, you know rapport so it is it is more challenging in the post-pandemic world it requires a lot more effort from us as leaders to 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 just try to understand where the other person is coming from and create that environment of trust one way I do it is, of course, the simple human conversations. I think we all underestimate how important it is just to have an interaction, human conversation to overcome any um, misunderstandings led by differences of opinion, differences of upbringing. So I think just having those human conversations and again, being intentional about them, because in a hybrid context, you will not have this corridor that you walk in the corridor and you suddenly see somebody and say, oh, I haven't seen you in two weeks. You will actually have to kind of, and I schedule those conversations because I know when is the last time I spoke to um, Rajesh or you know, the last time I spoke to Anuj. And, and I don't mean work-wise, I mean just generally. How is everything? How are things are going? Uh, yesterday evening, I was talking to one of my colleagues and those are not scheduled. I don't schedule them. I schedule them in my calendar, but the other person doesn't know that I'm going to, it's not a formal schedule. Um, but when I will catch up or reach out to somebody, you will sense if there is any, anything that it's brewing. A lot of diversity related issues are small things that keep brewing. And these are opportunities to, to, to remove them just by talking. So Rashesh, uh, one, uh, I think uh, Esther just mentioned it. I think, uh, uh, even we don't find a huge issue in terms of uh, adjustment, at least within India, because if you look at the population that we hire, basically engineers or people with prior experience in sales or manufacturing, they come with a background wherein they have worked in similar companies, similar organizations, so alignment, adjustment is not a big issue. Um, however, there are subcultures uh, which have experienced, for example, a manufacturing plant location will have a subculture which is slightly different from a sales organization or a corporate office uh, culture. And people may have a little bit of uh, issue in adjustment, but uh, they get over it very soon. It is not really a big deal. It's not a deal breaker at all. 
So people learn, adjust, acclimatize, that happens. The other bit is about diversity. You know, from an adjustment point of view, uh, we, we try and increase the number of, at least when we are talking about gender diversity, which is one diversity that we are working on, increase the number of women folk in our, in our organizations. Wherein we have found that to be a challenge because even in my earlier organization, Tata Motors, or even in my existing organization, uh, when it comes to uh, women folk in sales or women folk on the manufacturing front, uh, here, for example, at Polycap, still at least on the blue collar factory front, we have women who are doing assembly operations. But uh, in my earlier organization, Tata Motors, there are very few in sales and marketing, extremely few because it was a different kind of a job. And there's a mental makeup that perhaps women cannot do this kind of a job. And which is not really true. Uh, they haven't been tested enough. But yes, some experiments have happened. But therefore, in terms of their adjustment or uh, their acceptance uh, in, a, in, in a particular area of business, is something that is still a struggle in some areas, as far as we are concerned. We want to see more women, uh, and uh, but that is not something that is still work in progress, honestly, as we are doing. Great. I'm going to now move to the people management questions because there are dozens of them that are there. Um, so question that has come in, uh, you know, and I'd like uh, Esther to answer this, uh, is, you know, there are obviously old employees and then there are new employees. Uh, how do you ensure that these two get to work together without the old ones feeling insecure? The ego hassles are out, uh, you know, and, and they actually, you know, want to collaborate and work as a team. So that's a great question. And it's uh, a great challenge because I think as entrepreneurs, we have multiple challenges to overcome, whether it's on the product front, on the investment front, on the client front. But I always find the people challenges the most fascinating because there is no one way to do things, right? It's it just really your art as a leader. And when I say leader, it's I'm very careful using that word because it's just an experimentation. At the end of the day, it's all about getting a team together. When human beings get together, there is two forces and, and Hogan assessments, the Hogan's have done a lot of work on that. They talk about how we have a desire to compete because that's what has helped us as a species to, to evolve. So there is, a, there, is a, there is a desire to compete within us and competition is exactly what you mentioned just now, you know? Uh, don't trust others. Someone is gonna come and you know, grow more than me. And that's an in instinct that we need to, we all have and we have it. Now there's also the other instinct that we need each other to survive, right? So, so on the one hand, we have an instinct to compete. On the other hand, we do have an instinct to collaborate and we need both within teams you need a, a level of healthy competition so people push each other and help each other and, and have that desire and that ambition but at the at the end of the day as you correctly said when we grow as an organization in different stages we're going to need different expertises we're going to need specialists on a particular area we're not going to need people with more experience and we're going to have to bring people who will have to now collaborate with the older team and and it's it's a a, a lot of uh, challenges that come with insecurities and so on and so forth. Now, how have we solved it? How have I solved it? Number one is, again, a lot of communication. Um, my approach has always been very um, consensus driven. So if I am seeing, and that's something that comes within the team, the team itself would say, we need somebody who has this level of experience. Because we, every quarter, when we talk about what, where we are as a business and what we're trying to do, we always talk about what are the capabilities we have and what's the capabilities we need. So that's not a decision that I take. That's a decision that we take as a team that actually we need to build capabilities on higher editorial uh, capable experience or we need capabilities on if we're going to plan, for example, we are now doing uh, training and development uh, programs and we need a capability of people who have instructional design because we don't have that. Or we need a capability, our digital business is growing. We need a capability of somebody who's managed large scale projects. There is a project manager already in that room. He or she is saying, we do need more experience on that because this has now become bigger. And I'm fine to accept that this has become way bigger. And that's where the problems are. No? So I think a lot of it starts at the core, which who decides when we need to bring new people in the team. And when you make that decision, a team decision, 
half of your battle is won. So in a way, even if it's obvious to you, I would still em- encourage you to make sure that you know it comes ideally from someone else and not you. Because when it comes from me, then maybe Rajesh will feel uh, that, okay, Esther is not happy with me. And that just becomes a big issue for you as a leader to have to have a conversation saying, no, it's not about you and blah, 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 blah. So let that person say, we need capabilities. That's number one. Number two, when you bring people on board, it's going to be a big challenge. Now, it's your responsibility as a leader to onboard that person. If a person fails, is your failure. So what do you need to do? I have no clue what all you'll have to do, but you'll have to do a lot of things. And it will be very agile because you can't plan what all you'll have to do. Yes, there are things you can plan. Make sure that person meets everyone in the team one-on-one. Make sure you design opportunities for people to be, because again, going back to trust, you need the trust first. People should like each other. If you like me, you're more likely to help me. So what is it that you can architect so then people like each other? People connect with each other. And after that, there'll be many things that will come. There'll be resistance. There'll be people trying to uh, bombard the success of that investment or that hiring. Some of them will do it consciously. Some of them will do it unconsciously. And all of those things will happen. Now, it is your responsibility as a hiring manager, as a CEO, to make that person successful. Now, there's a third alternative that maybe you hire the wrong person. That happens. So then you have a different problem. Now, if you identify that you hire somebody, there are issues, but actually the issues are real because we hired the wrong person. Then take the decision very quickly because it's, it's not going to be good for a- anybody. So these are my three. I mean, I could go on and on because this topic is, I can give you examples if you wish to, but I, I would rather maybe leave Rajesh and her harsh points as well to, to add. Rajesh, what do you on this one? Uh, Rashish, so for example, uh, I see in my current organization, uh, a lot of people who are, who have spent uh, years, decades in the organization and new people coming in. Usually when you hire new people at the, in the lower management or middle management, there's not much of an issue. What happens is uh, people get sensitive or worried when you hire a younger person at the top or a new person comes at the top irrespective of age you suddenly have a new leader and then the entire team and the vertical suddenly starts feeling a little insecure that this is a new guy who's coming from outside. Uh, I don't know what kind of an animal he will be. And and therefore, even if you have somebody who's very tenured within the organization, uh, he also starts having doubts. What I've seen is uh, in Polycare, for example, although I have spent only five months, six months here, uh, there is uh, there is there are islands of expertise in these old people. People who have spent decades in the organization, they are uh, in majority of the cases have tacit knowledge which is very very special. For example, we have a guy who is uh, uh, very knowledgeable in PVC, and there's nobody like him in the organization. He is tenured, very old, and he had a person coming as his boss from outside. Uh, it was a difficult situation, but I think uh, the person coming in from outside also needs to have a level of maturity. I think that is one of the criteria that uh, HR and the senior leadership needs to look out for when it comes to hiring. Uh, does this guy come with a level of maturity in addition to the functional knowledge that he brings in? So as to accept the fact that there are other people in the organization who may have knowledge which is very different from his, who are senior, but probably I will be reporting to him just because or the organization needs a manager at the top. So I think mutual respect is critical. You will also need to identify, you know, uh, skill gaps because very often uh, insecurities come in because you have not really spent enough developmental time on the people who are in the system. You have allowed them to evolve naturally and perhaps that is not the right decision. And therefore half the, pro- half the problem, more than half the problem has been created by you. And I would uh, hold HR also responsible as, uh, as, as uh, people who are responsible for managing talent, they needed to invest in people who have tenured also. Nothing stops us from doing And I don't think there's anyone who will say that I will stop learning in this particular age. It is critical that you invest in people and uh, that will bring down this huge discomfort that happens in an organization when a new talent joins. I think that is, that is largely it. I would say mutual respect, very, very critical. 
uh, ensure that uh, you admit that you have tacit knowledge hidden in pockets and corners with these senior folks, which you need to respect, nurture, build on them. And as HR and as senior management, ensure that the skill gap, if at all, it is there in these people, which has happened over a period of years, because they were in your organization, you're responsible for it and you start investing it sooner or later than later. Before you answer that question, there's one more which is aligned to this one. Uh, so let's say there are two people, and this is specific that's come on the dashboard right now. If there are two people in the organization at critical positions, both of them who do not like each other, okay, but both important, how do you balance the two? Do you allow them to do it themselves or do you intervene? I think this is a different question. Let's finish the first one. You know, yeah. This is a completely different question. I don't think yeah. it's going to be the sure. first one at all. So I think the first question which you're saying is a real issue faced by all growing organizations and organizations which who want to shift gears in terms of their growth. And you know, whenever an organization starts growing, you really start realizing that because of the complexity of, of scale, you need certain new skills or the current skills are not able to manage the complexity of the growth challenge. It could also be due to the fact that, okay, there are certain skills which are lacking in, in the current team. So first of all, one has to be clear what exactly you want to hire and why you want to do it. I think that's very, very important. Having done that, you have to select individuals who are good with people. You know, if you get a very capable person but has a different leadership style, for example, is very dictatorial or very not at all people-centric, then uh, it will just upset the whole organization. And you don't want your good guys who may have been with you for a long period of time all of a sudden leave you, you know. Number three, whenever you do that, normally you do it at a higher pay scale compared to the existing guys. And that's natural. There will be huge resistance from the existing people. Why are you paying? And normally, you may say that you know, salary is secret, but these kind of information leak out. So there is a risk attached to the fact that there will be the internal resistance because you are paying the new guy at a higher pay scale, you know. But there is no alternative, you know. If you select the right person with the right competency and pay that person well, and that start person gets accepted well in the team and more importantly starts performing, then everybody else will shut up, you know, because they see the impact of that person coming in. Uh, so it's very important that you navigate this route by making the right choices, why you're doing it, and how do you make that person settle down and ensure that that person starts performing. And if he, if that person is a good people leader, then that person will be able to work with the older lot. In spite of that, there may be some people who are upset and this, then some old people will leave. But in the organization's journey, sometimes you have to let it happen because unless you get in new skills, unless you get in uh, more capable people, you will not grow. So the organization's interest has to come first and not some old employee who have been there for long. Their interest should not come first. And in that process, it's if there is some disruption in terms of attrition, which may happen, it's okay as long as the overall result uh, because of recruitment is positive for the organization. Now, to answer your second question, what is the second question, which is... The uh, question is more specific, saying that there are two people at key positions. Both of uh, them don't like each other. Basically, interpersonal relationships you're talking of at higher right. level. That's natural, you know, it happens. I think the key thing is to identify what... Uh, it could be for whatever reason. It could be a power play. It could be a different leadership style. It could be, I mean, chemistry. So one has to analyze what's why this is happening, you know, and this you analyze, you cannot deal with it. So I think the first step is to analyze why is there a difference of opinion and somebody may have to step in, you know. I mean, ideally speaking, at very senior levels, you should point out to them and tell them that, okay, we would expect you at a very senior level to resolve it amongst ourselves and if there is a need, then we will, somebody should step in from our end, whether it's the HR head or coach or somebody and, or the boss. Uh, but this has to be handled because at senior level, if there is there's a disruption, there is a, there is, the relationship is not good, then it can filter down, uh, down the line and people will start, uh, it's not a good healthy thing. So one has to proactively resolve this by interventions, either 
let them do it on their own or by putting in some other person and try and arrive at at least, if not the best of friends, uh, uh, a chemistry which is workable within the organization, which does not impact the organization. Okay. Rajesh, any thoughts from your side on this one? Uh, Rashesh, uh, one of the things, one of the reasons I've seen, I've seen this happening. I've seen this happening. One of the reasons, I think it's the our own doing or the doing of the organization rather than the people. Uh, it's like uh, you have two captains to steer a ship. And you have not really very clearly demarcated who's responsible for what. And therefore, there are a lot of assumptions. Or by design, the responsibilities are so overlapping that there will be friction. So it's, it's uh, in some cases I have seen wherein the organization design has been created or has been, it's, it has been a legacy issue, but which is now resulting in friction because there are two functions which are very close. Let me give, to give an example. Sales and marketing are supposed to work very close to each other. But if both of them are very strong personalities, there are enough opportunities for these guys to rub themselves in the wrong manner. So typically in many organizations, you have one boss at the top who is responsible for settling these differences, if at all they arise. So you have uh, certain functions which are closely aligned functions, uh, which if not properly managed or not clearly demarcated, can give rise to these, uh, uh, these kind of frictions or these kind of issues wherein both are important, but somehow by design, they are, they are, they are, you know, they are, they are fighting and they are probably not mature enough also at that point in time. And as Harsh says, says, there's somebody who needs to come, their manager needs to come in, HR needs to step in to resolve. But I really do not see whether it can, this kind of a resolution will work because at, at the heart of such issues is the design of the organization and uh, the people issues come later, slightly later on, because you can resolve it for once. But I won't be surprised if these issues come up again three months down the line or six months down the line. Um, I'm going to take one question, Esther, to you before we move on a five-minute break. Uh, the question is, how do you balance uh, you know, interpersonal relationships and the competition? Right. Uh, basically, the idea is to have a healthy competition in the organization without actually getting people at loggerhead with each other. Uh, you're talking within leaders, within teams? Within teams. So a lot of, a lot of it goes uh, with the way we create incentives or uh, uh, recognition programs. Um, I think we all need to be clear. And I think, I think that's quite challenging to be clear about what kind of uh, people strategy will I have? What kind of culture we want to create? And hence, how are we going to reward performance and, and what are we going to reward? I think a lot of it is uh, the conflicts and the um, conflicting messaging that we do is because we say something as an organization, say we want people to collaborate, but then we pay sales incentives individually, for example, and it's all about what you have achieved. So I think we have a huge dissonance on that and that creates a lot of issues because then people don't even understand why those conflicts arise. Now, in our case, we have a culture, it's a very collaborative culture. It's a very um, collective culture, which has its pluses and its minuses, by the way. There's no culture that it's perfect, but that's what works for us. That's who we are as an organization, which basically means if, if you look at our sales incentives, our team incentives. So the first trigger is the team has to achieve. So if the team doesn't achieve, there's no sales incentive for anybody. So there has to be a threshold and the threshold is team driven. Which, and then after that, the, the calculation of how much will Esther get as opposed to a tool will be depending on how much my uh, individual target was achieved, right? But the first threshold is all of us have to achieve. Otherwise, none of us will get anything. Now that creates a very interesting behavior because then people actually smartly gravitate on how much I need to help Esther because if she doesn't reach her 80%, then none of us will get it. So there is a level of collaboration, but at the same time, once we all have achieved the team target, then there is a level of competition that, okay, this, you know, this account I'm going to go after because I want to overachieve my targets uh, and, you know, 
maximize my incentive. So I think the design of rewards is a very, very, very strategic tool to help people find that balance between collaboration and competition. And you need both behaviors. You need people to collaborate because it's, you can't survive without collaboration, but you do want that competition. So how do you design the rewards is one very strategic way. And it's a little bit trial and error because you'll really need to see what works for you. Um, and there's a lot of deep thinking about what does philosophically this reward will entail? What is the behavior? And, and always be careful with what, and there's a story, it's an Indian story. I don't know if, if, you, if you have heard it, this cobra story. Uh, have you heard that story of the cobras? Should I explain it very quickly? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. So, so there was, it, it seems there was some king somewhere in the olden times. Uh, and there was, a, there was a, a big threat of a lot of cobras in that region. So the king said that, okay, if you, if you get me a dead cobra, I will give you so much money, right? So suddenly uh, a lot of dead cobras started to emerge and they, you know, they will go to the king and say, here is 10 dead cobras and he will then pay and so on and so forth. Now, what happened is that suddenly people started to create cobra um, farms. People start actually uh, breeding cobras because that was like an awesome business. Suddenly, you know, hundreds of cobras and thousands of cobras um, emerge in the kingdom. And then the king said, oh, what have I done? And then he said, okay, from now on, I'll not pay for uh, dead cobras anymore. So what happened is all those thousands and thousands of farmers who created uh, that as a business then released the cobras. And the problem became, as you can imagine, 7,000 times bigger than it was before. So that's the problem with incentives. So you just need to be very careful and ask your question for saying, is there any cobra here? Am I doing something? It may be a short-term thing that you want to do. It may look very smart short-term, but what's the cobra that you're creating? Is the cobras there? You know, and that's one example we always use internally because it just helps us talk the same language. If anybody has any idea, it may look really shiny and really good, but is there a cobra there and just, just have that conversation and, and be careful. But for me, collaboration and competition, incentives is the key. And always think through, can I see any cobra emerging from, from this idea? I, as you speak, I was thinking of a couple of years ago where we had a cobra in the organization uh, and, and we did the same mistake. Uh, but uh, thank you for answering this question. Uh, we're going to take a quick five minute break. We will reassemble at 11.10. Uh, and that time we'll be taking specific questions. So there are questions that uh, our members have sent across to us and many of them putting it on the dashboard. So I'll read out those specific questions and then you can answer the same. Right, so uh, welcome back. I think it's a big bit for Rajesh, is he in? Okay, so before they join in uh, and you know, as we go ahead, uh, there's, there's a, the, the dashboard is open for, the chat box is open for questions. So if you want to put in your questions, you can, just share it out there, and we'd be happy to ask the questions to our uh, to our leaders out here. Um, Harsh, that's a very interesting question uh, from one of the entrepreneurs. He says that um, he believes that his business could grow at two x, and um, while he's been able to you know talk to his team about it, but somehow his team doesn't seem to be aligned, and they are keen at growing only at thirty uh, percent. What should he do? Oh my God. Oh my God. This is difficult one. <laughs> uh, I think he has to rationalize why, you know, you can grow at double the space. So you have to go a little bit more deeper into what uh, arrive at necessary building blocks in terms of what can lead to growth, you know. So there'll be some growth drivers, whether it's an existing business or a new business or acquisitions or what makes that person confident. So you have to break it down into into minor parts and, you know, lead to a, like a cascade in terms of what can, how can the business grow? And, you know, you need to then have a dialogue with them in terms of what are their views, what can come in the way, but it has to be broken up and it has to be a dialogue. And ultimately, I think the leader, if that person is convinced, he should be able to convince others. If something else, which comes from the team, which there could be a blind spot at the leader's end, then, you know, he, that person should lower based on uh, the overall interactions and consensus. But it's very important that 
it's aligned and you know ultimately i think when uh, when there is resistance i have seen that it's resistance to risk taking you know so only way to do that is to say that okay if there is something new let's prototype that and reduce the risk by prototyping on a small scale uh because there is no answer to a certain new initiative with a leader may think uh, will lead to growth uh, unless it is tried out in the marketplace so i would say that you know you uh, break that resistance by saying that okay let's try this out and see what is the response to that you know on a small scale uh, by prototyping and then uh, if that prototyping results are successful then then it will be good uh, way to convince others um as per any any feedback from your side there's an entrepreneur say that he believes his organization can grow at 2x uh, but his team is actually wanting to grow at 30% uh so any thoughts from your end i've i've actually had the opposite problem in my team that i've always thought that okay let's be practical let's see and i i always have that my team a little disappointed so i had to do the opposite so i think it's about readjusting and 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 i think the harshest point about fear of failure is probably one of the reasons that's driving that um people want to take on things that they can uh, achieve or they visualize and especially if you have i mean i think it's important for you as a leader to understand uh, the level how practical your team members are some people are very imaginative and they tend to see things even if they haven't seen it before and some of us tend to be very practical and actually until you don't see things and that's what i love harsh's idea about prototyping because it allows the imaginative lot in your team to 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 get to test what they see maybe they see more than i see or more than we see and for those who are more practical or a little more i would say a little more risk averse the piloting part is also a very great way to to achieve that it's also a, a little bit can be a wake up call sometimes if you have somebody in your core team who maybe is not growing at the speed that the organization is growing or the rest of the team so also it's maybe a a, a beginning of a watch up uh, situation that you may have somebody in the team who's actually slowing down the rest and that also you need to notice because not everyone will have the same ambition to grow not everyone will have the same appetite or maybe even personal situation to to go at the speed that the rest of the team so you'll have to assess whether it's a team it's is it a one person related stuff if that is the case then why is that what's the drive of that is it a capability issue is it a is it a confidence issue is it a motivation issue or is it a team level um Uh, situation I'm, i have had situations of individuals stopping the drive say well that's not possible and and really it's not possible when it's not possible in their mind and i remember that was in the early days when you said okay instead of doing let's say we were doing uh 10 initiatives in a quarter why don't we do you know we had the opportunity to do 20 and there was one person said it's not possible and i remember that sentence even today saying that only if you and i think her her comment was only if you increase the number of hours in a day only then it will be possible now that person had reached a place where it was very difficult to unlock that person out of that position so you will coach and you will try but if you reach a moment that there's one one individual that it's slowing down then i think going back to harsh's point before that the organizational direction and trajectory is beyond individuals uh, you know uh, trajectories so then that's a separate conversation where you'll have to have a coaching conversation and maybe the moment has come for that person to take a se- separate role within the organization maybe not be part of the core team or potentially even move out of the organization if that is uh, what's going to be best for everyone yeah i think you have, she has got a good very good point because there will be resistance from some individuals you need to identify is there one or two individuals uh, having a larger impact on other colleagues of that person so you if that person doesn't have the same degree of ambition or uh, risk taking then you know if you're not able to resolve it then it may be better for in the organization interest for that person to first to be coach but if it is still not resolved then it's okay for that that person to leave the organization uh, thank you so much um sorry the next question i like to ask so there is an entrepreneur who's asking the trade off between uh, grooming someone for a leadership role 
or getting someone in from outside and when do you when do you give up on on the grooming bit uh that's that's for me uh, yeah that's for you that's for you um i think uh, one all organizations have a talent philosophy and uh, for example whether it's polycab or whether it's tata motors uh we tata motors especially since i've spent 28 years i can talk a lot more about tata motors we believed in grooming people from within uh so there is a talent management program which is run within the organization which uh, identifies uh, high performers and uh, invests in them in terms of capability building in terms of inputs in terms of putting them up to stretch assignments so and of course giving them uh, higher level responsibilities uh, which normally wouldn't have come their way if they had grown normally in an organization and that is one way we test out our leadership strength potential and groom future leaders at the same time uh, if you look at uh, the organization uh, we have also we had also hired people from outside now the the i think the choice is between the when do we hire from outside and when do we promote talent from within if you have talent from within who you feel can deliver on what the organizational objectives are which we spoke about right at the beginning then probably you don't need to hire from outside but the reason why we are doing it today at this point in time is because today's need is perhaps far more critical and i don't have a bench strength inside i don't have talent inside who can readily move into let's say a head of sales and marketing role or a head of international business role or a head of manufacturing location in pune for example if i and i have looked at uh, let's say my talent manufacturing head in lucknow or adharwad and i find that the uh, role at pune is far too complex and cannot be handled by a, by a person within and for this to happen you know we need to have a very robust talent review process which happens uh, very systematically through the organization so that the top team is completely clued on who is capable of achieving what and what is the potential so if you are completely aware that the talent cannot come from within i think that is the moment you take a decision that i need to go outside for this kind of a talent because although i am building my pipeline my talent is still not reached that level wherein i am 100% confident that to deliver my this year or probably the next two or three years uh, growth objectives Uh, somebody can somebody from within can come in so once you feel once you rule that out is is when you start looking at talent from outside but having said that very often we have also scanned the marketplace and found that the talent outside is nearly not as good so we have also gone back we have also gone back saying that fine the talent outside is also is only incrementally 10% better so should we really look at talent from outside or should we invest much more in the guy inside and try and help him handle him support him to ensure that he succeeds so it's a, it's a, it's a balance it's a mix and match of decisions that you take based on the based on where you find yourself in your in the planning cycle um any thoughts from you harsh on this one yeah i think this there's a larger issue of talent succession pipeline you know and that is the responsibility of senior leadership you know because many i think it's a very important role the senior leadership has to play and it should be a part of their key result areas you know how robust is my succession pipeline at least at senior levels you know and normally this gets addressed at the board level the board has to demand from the ceo and cxos uh, about the talent succession pipeline it has to get reviewed in the nomination and remunerations committee so there has to be a lot of top down expectations from senior leadership to create a very strong internal pipeline you know because unless that is there it will just not happen on its own and as rajesh was saying you need to then ensure that the senior it's not the senior the the potential people who are who could be groomed up for uh, bigger roles there is a certain uh, development which could take place it could be coaching it could be job rotation it could be extra responsibility so you have to groom that pipeline automatically it will not happen you know so and that grooming has to be led by hr and and the topmost person within the organization and you know they have to go on reviewing uh, what could be done with each individual especially at the middle senior levels and then yeah. at an individual level have a development plan for each individual which will groom and which will test that individual in in different roles uh, to ensure that uh, there is a stronger pipeline
Thanks, Mr. Uh, as for the next questions for you, uh, this is usually something that most mid level organizations do is they promote people who are good performers. Uh, but these people may not necessarily be great managers or people managers, right? How do you identify if a good performer is, is a people manager or a manager material? And can training help? It, it, it's a great question. And, and I think one of the ways to identify, I think the point that Harsh mentioned before about the like the liking of working with others or having that interpersonal skills is a very important element of a people manager. And I think we need to be quite clear that you can see that in many fronts. You don't have to make somebody a manager to see whether he or she is a good people manager. Uh, the way we do it is we work with uh, squads. So you have in People Matters, you have an opportunity to be a, a team leader, even if people don't report to you. So for every product, every project, we'll have a cross-functional team and there is always a, a team leader. And, and even within that squad, they are, they are playing a leadership role because each one of us is representing their function within that squad. So everyone gets a lot of opportunities to play that leader role and just experience whether you know, they like it, they don't like it, because it's all about influencing others, aligning others. And, and there is a lot of energy on, on the human element of alignment. And there are some people who love it and there's some people who don't love it so much. They're more, you know, they're, they're more, in, they're more uh, individuals who may like more in-depth work, who may actually like more, um, you know, less interaction with people as possible. So, so I think it's important that we identify um, and, and create opportunities for growth for people within the organization that may not have a people manager aspiration. I think traditionally in many organizations, um, you can only grow salary-wise or designation-wise if you grow in the managerial ladder. And I think that's a big problem because then we end up then forcing people who are not inclined to be people managers to want to be people managers because not because they wanted the role or the composition of the role, but because they just want to grow and they have ambition and they have aspirations. So I think it's important we create those career ladders within the organization, which is not necessarily managerial uh, growth. Uh, because there are a lot of individuals who don't have the inclination and they don't have the aptitude to manage people. And I think it's difficult, even if there's a coaching conversation, because a lot of people may not even be aware that this is actually not your strength. And it's not easy, especially in India, people have that aspiration that I will become a, a manager or a people manager. And culturally, that's a good thing. But some people are just very unhappy in that role. <laughs> so there is really no point. And the antidote to that is to create a career ladder that does not necessarily have um, people as a reporting, uh, signaling that you're growing. You can still grow as a senior manager or AGM for a specialized role or for a very uh, individual contributor role. Don't force people into roles that they're not going to be happy with. So just to add to what Esther is saying, I fully agree with her. There will be an organization, there will be individuals who are, who are very good at the individual level. The organization, if they're adding a lot of value, especially these roles will be in the area of technology, which could be very, very relevant. It could be a scientist who is not a good people's manager, but that scientist is coming out with some patterns or something which is hugely valuable for the organization. Normally, the tendency is to actually not promote that person and not put him in a higher grade because... He is not a good people's manager, but there is an opportunity to create a separate grade, gradation structure for the specialist roles. But they have to be really specialists and they should be able to add substantial value. And the organization should say that if that person leaves, it will put me back. So for I think the one way out is to actually have a separate gradation structure for those individuals who are truly valuable, truly valuable. Otherwise, you know, you don't take an average person. And then, you know, make them rise in that they don't follow that normal gradation structure, but there is a special separate grade for, for that particular technology ladder. And then, you know, compensation and, you know, the grade and all are structured based on that person's individual contributions because these contributions are truly valuable to the organization. Yeah. And uh, Rashesh, you know, uh, I have gone through so many leadership goal sheets, okay, and business managers goal sheets. 
most of the goals are very very business goals quantified hard numbers uh people talk about market share they talk about sales numbers they talk about profitability they talk about uh, tax saving they talk about new products launched and uh, i mean there is no actually no line item which talks about people collaboration okay or or uh, managing people and invariably uh you know people uh, i have seen people getting rewarded for these results delivering on uh, these critical parameters which are important from a financial and a market standing of an organization they may be not be the best of managers best of people managers but they still get rewarded year after year after year i think the onus is on the uh, senior leadership the management the hr of the organization to to actually uh, dwell deeper into how how a manager is performing and coach him and uh, push him towards becoming a better manager because i don't think there's any other uh, any other way to actually sensitize these guys in terms of becoming one frequent measurements frequent talking frequent coaching is is something which is required because all their hard measurements are numbers and you can't take them away and nobody will say that take away hard numbers and replace them with you know uh, softer measures like how well is he accepted within the team how good a manager he is he in the team i don't think that will ever happen so there has to be a side by side process which which builds this capability of this increases the sensitivity of the individual to become a better manager uh, i think it need, it needs to be a a side by side approach uh, besides the hard business numbers okay. uh, there's a specific and interesting question uh, it says uh, should one transition from a fixed salary structure to a goal linked salary structure and any experience or thoughts around it i'm going to leave that question open to all three of you to answer so i can share our experience um uh, we've experimented a lot um uh, with different ways of compensation and we've made some um some i think some successes some failures and and it's a lot of it is goes connected back to to what i was sharing before about having a philosophy uh, a people philosophy and and your reward structure needs to connect to that so in our case one of the very important philosophical elements is is the whole layer of ownership so we expect everyone in people matters to 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 behave like an owner so hence there has to be a connection of that um trait so that's one thing the second is the second trait is about impact and results so again that that's another philosophical element that needs to be seen in the way that we compensate people uh, and then the third element is this whole a- layer of collaboration and working with each other so if you look at these three philosophical elements the way we structure compensation is number one there is a esop pool uh, 8% of people matters is owned by employees today which is a very um, significant number and it's it's across levels so what we look at is actually ownership if you are able to display ownership you're somebody who always tries for um you know finding solutions to problems you always go beyond your call of duty it's not for senior colleagues anybody in the organization can be part of the esop pool so that has helped a lot and we are now a 12 year old organization we implemented the esop i think around 6 years ago and it was very difficult in the beginning because people were saying but we are not a listed company what does it really even mean to me and so on and so forth but when we raise capital uh we have raised capital twice in between so people started to see what it meant it started to see that the valuation was increasing and people started to visualize when there is an opportunity to exit what will it what could it mean to me which is a more of a wealth creation philosophy and not just looking at salary but really looking at what does it really mean to be part of an organization that is growing and beyond salary so i think that's been a big journey and i'm telling you it's been 6 years now that i'm evangelizing the importance of wealth creation and not just look at compensation um fix and variable so that's one thing that has worked uh the second thing about results the variable and fix has also worked for us there is a um, component of variability in everyone's salary and very the amount of variable depends on how senior you are in the organization the more senior the higher is the variability uh, and it goes to up to 30% 35% in some roles as well now how we calculate that there is a sales um process and there is a non sales so if you're a sales colleague 
I've already shared with all of you, it goes with, it's a team target. And the trigger is team driven and the trigger is cash in bank. So we don't look at sales or invoice. The first big trigger is cash in bank. So that's the first. If, if we achieve our team target and cash in bank, then we look at individual performance and then we calculate incentive. It really has worked very well because you have the sales team and the delivery team and the finance team totally aligned on one very important metric, which is, you know, collections. It, it is really worked very, very well for us. Um, and the sales team gets involved if something goes wrong or if there is a challenge or a client is not happy, then suddenly there's a huge alignment to make sure clients are happy and the sales team takes ownership of that. For the non-sales team, we look at uh, sales incentive we pay quarterly, but for the non-sales team, we do annually and, um, and we look at overall organization achieving the, the target. And then again, the same, first, all of us have to achieve Maybe your team has achieved, but if your overall organization hasn't achieved, then there's no bonus for anybody. So again, the same philosophy that first team wins and then you win. First is organization and then is individual. For calculation of individual um, bonus, we look at uh, performance and we do, you know, what typically will be like review conversations. And, and we normally just have, we simplify it. We just have three levels, whether you have, you know, in the, you have achieved and then you get 100% or you're somewhere in the middle and you get, um, you know, between 60 to 80% or in some cases we may give a token amount. If, but we're quite generous with the bonus because we believe that we really are not carrying anybody who's not contributing. As a culture, if you're not contributing, you're not going to get to know at the time uh, that bonus gets disbursed. You definitely get to know earlier in our culture. So that's the way we've structured it. Uh, Harsh, there's a question uh, from... So just to add to what she yes, said, right. and variable. So I think in each industry, there are certain trends which are happening. So you need to find out in your sector, what are the trends in terms of variable pay? What are the trends in terms of wealth creation opportunities? ESOPs and, you know, it's now very normal at very senior levels to combine fixed with variable and ESOPs, you know. And normally the variable at senior levels go up to 50% of fixed uh, and ESOPs is in addition to that. Uh, at middle level also, I think there is fixed and variable, it may not be ESOPs. And at sales function, it could be monthly incentives, you know, depending on what sales you achieve. But I think the most important thing in, in doing this is to have a very robust performance management system. You know, if your performance management system is not robust and it's not fair, then it will create a lot of dissonance within the organization. So you, whoever has got variable, that person is to earn the variable, then it should be fair. And people should say, yes, he earned that variable. And that variable can, can vary. Somebody could get zero variable, somebody could get 50%. But a lot will, if the performance management system is robust, then automatically, I think all criticism against this will stop. But if the performance management system is not good, then it will actually have a lot of problems. So the, the bedrock of, starting a variable pay is to have first a very strong performance management system, which would include things like goal sheets, stretch levels, goal audits, goal review audits. So it's, that is the most important thing before you start a variable pay. But I think it is increasingly organizations have realized that, you know, if just by, if you want to attract talent, you will have to give a combination of fixed variable and wealth creating opportunity, especially at senior levels. You know, uh, Rashesh, I mean, completely agree with Esther and, uh, you know, Harsh. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if you're, if the question was, can we change from a fix to a variable today? Very difficult. People will not buy. Uh, uh, from a hiring perspective, uh, you know, I find it very difficult to hire people unless I give a certain minimum percentage high on fixed. If I give a, a, a phenomenally high percentage on variable, people are not willing. They are not. They do not have the risk appetite because they believe variable pay is risk pay, pay at risk. So they are not willing to buy in there. So there is a certain amount of comfort that people derive, uh, especially when you are hiring, uh, that this is something, let's say a 20% or 15% or a 25% hike is what people would expect on the fixed but if you give them a 40% hike on variable saying that, or a 40% hike saying that bulk of the high increase on the variable, uh, the, the people, will, you will not have as many takers. So there is a the risk appetite which people have, which we need to uh, 
which we need to address. And secondly, in an existing organization, if you're trying to change the comm structure from variable uh, from fixed to variable, you need to involve people because uh, there is, a, again, the same risk appetite. People need to be sure that I'm at least getting this much for performing the basic level of responsibility that I'm supposed to perform. So it's a people issue largely, uh, which needs a lot of communication, a lot of acceptance, especially if an organization is huge, more complex a problem. In a smaller organization, it can be far easily managed. Okay. So I'm going to come to my last two questions. I've already, already got a few from the team to, uh, to wrap it up. Um, so Rajesh and Esther, this is for you. Uh, what, according to you, is more suitable, a, flex, a flexible timing or a fixed timing? And this is in perspective to building discipline in the organization. Esther, you can go first. So uh, I think there is no, again, in, in business or in managing people, there is no black and white. And a lot of it you will have to discover. And I'm going to tell you a story. I remember in the early days, uh, we've always had very flexible time. Because it's like, it doesn't matter. No, we are all coming here for a purpose. We all need to figure out how to achieve that purpose. And we trust you that you will do what's right for the organization. And that's always been philosophically the way we've um, operated. And I remember this was, of course, way before COVID. And uh, there was one individual who used to come late. Late means 10.30, 10.45. And, you know, like you had this period between 9 o'clock to whatever, 10.30. Like, good morning, good morning, good morning. And like I have come at 8.30 and somebody comes at 11. It's still good morning, good morning. So it's like it's not good morning anymore. So in my greatest idea, I, I decided that we need a, uh, I think it was a, a time, working time policy or, you know, whatever, working time policy arrangement. So we created a small, and we were very small. We were just maybe 25 of us. So in my greatest idea, I decided that we should document our working times. And I kind of wrote it and said that, you know, guys, let's try to reach between 9 and 9.30 and let's try to leave between 6 to 6.30, which is what I've always seen when I worked in other organizations prior to starting People Matters. And it was such a disaster because people felt like for one individual, you're creating a policy. Right. And, and I think that's the big failure. When we scale our business, we need to be careful about, yes, there'll be people who may uh, take advantage of situation. Those are coaching opportunities and not opportunities to now document policies. If we can't trust our teams that they will do the right thing, there is no way you can document. So between fixed times and flexible times, honestly, it really depends on what is the business need. Like if I, if I'm, yesterday I was discussing with my sales uh, team, member and he was saying that you know we need we need the team back in the big cities because sales are happening now face to face again and this working remote is all fine but there are people sitting in Deradun there are people sitting in Lonavla now there are no clients there so he was he the, the same question no working from home or working from office uh, the same is working flexibly or working fixed hours first is the business what does the business need number one and number two is how do you build flexibility around what the business needs? Because of course, flexibility is important and we all want it, uh, but first is the business need. But do not do a tick in the box like I did of creating a policy just for the sake of creating a policy. Look at what is needed from a business perspective first. So Rashish, you know, um, agree so much with Esther. Uh, it depends on the organization and depends upon where you're operating. For example, if I look at COVID, what happened? Manufacturing units were continuously working. They do not have the flexibility of coming whenever and going whenever. So for them, eight to six means eight to six, so eight to five means eight to five. The managers have to come, the supervisors have to come, everybody has to come. Okay, so they're no choice. I mean, it's, it's, it's dictated by the needs of the business. Sales organization was continuously working. They may not have been reporting to office, but they were reporting to the distributors, to the dealerships. So when the channel opens at 10 o'clock, they are there in, in front of the distributors or meeting customers, fleet operators in Tata Motors or here in case of Polycab, meeting distributors. So no choice again. They were working, the style of working changed. The flexibility largely existed for the people at uh, the head office, which are more into staff functions. So look at how businesses or private businesses in India have evolved. You know, we started off 
years ago only government offices existed government offices typically followed a 9 to 5 9 to 6 kind of a work routine which is what was replicated by the private organizations which came in later on gradually we felt that there could be some flexibility so for example in the earlier organization we said there has to be a prime or a or a key working uh, interval that is from 10 to 4 everybody should be there so you can come in two hours late and leave two hours later in the evening or adjust somewhere within the week in a week you need to make up but between 10 and 4 ensure that the core team is there everybody is there and i think once we experienced covid and the kind of flexibility that covid allowed we felt that even that was not required you needed to be basically you needed to ensure that work gets done how it gets done is entirely based upon you and your manager and your team as long as you guys are happy and the work gets done it's absolutely fine there's no nothing right or wrong about it so i would largely leave it at that that there are certain functions which would require you to stick to timings there are other functions which we have seen post covid which have become very dynamic and they have realized their own working styles and their own working times and i think we need to give them that kind of independence of flexibility first the last question is for you um is a high paying professional team a cause or a consequence of success sorry can you repeat again is a high paying professional is a high paying professional team a cause or a consequence of success <laughs> cause and effect <laughs> <coughs> i have a strong belief that <clears throat> good talent can actually drive growth in <clears throat> any sector any industry you know so i am a strong believer in investing in good talent first and automatically the result will follow you know so it's i have a strong belief that you have to go on investing in talent and go on improving your quality of talent on a perpetual basis whenever there is a vacancy you should try and say that the new incumbent who's coming into the role is better than the earlier and whenever i have taken that step in terms of improving the quality of talent or improve comp competency even at a higher cost it has paid off so i think the key thing is judge whether the person is right or not and go on investing in talent and the results will follow automatically because talent quality is good i don't know what others feel but i i strongly believe that organizations there is a war for talent and that war for talent has to occupy as much attention at the ceo level as the war for market share of growth would love to get both esther and rajesh to view point of this one yeah well I, i would definitely agree with harsh every time i've had the um you know the the fear that oh somebody is leaving for a position it's always been uh, an opportunity to say well now that we have to fill up this position what is the ideal candidate and and as harsh was saying before i think it creates an internal inequity for a, for a little bit of time but if we invest in the right talent you can fix the internal inequities over a period of time and you know kind of refit individuals to the right salary level so i i think it goes hand in hand the the aspiration the ambition of the teams is what's going to create the growth and when the growth comes people will also expect that now we are a larger company now our top line is growing our profitability is there so people will also expect that there is growth for them so i think it's also our responsibility to make sure as we as we aspire and as we push for growth we share that growth and we share that uh, within people who have um, contributed to that so it it is a continuous cycle it's not a cause and effect it's just a constructive loop of growth and development for everyone who is helping achieve that vision yeah so rashish i completely agree with both harsh and desh uh, i think it's a cycle uh, but i would start if i if i was to pick i would uh, start st i would start with talent invest in high quality talent and uh, believe that uh, the team within and the resources that can be provided to the talent will help him achieve the objectives for which he is hired as a result of which he ends up getting paid more and he as a result of that he starts performing more so it becomes a cycle but i would like to start with talent very very clearly okay. Okay, thank you so much uh, three of you for joining us this morning just one just one caveat to whatever i had mentioned and other than mentioned of course ultimately the business has to have a strong right to win you know so there has to be potential in the business now just if the business turn if you are in a commodity business which doesn't have any differentiator then uh, investing in very high cost talent may not 
may not uh, you may not be able to afford because the business itself is not built on strong fundamentals so i think the starting point is the business fundamentals how what is the potential what is the differentiator and can you grow and having decided that yes i have a potential to grow then invest in that point taken um Rishish, can we have the feedback taken now as you thank the speakers? Yes, yeah, that's going to come to. Uh, you can release the feedback form. Okay. Can we request uh, people to take this feedback? It's important for us to keep bettering all the huddle that we are uh, going to bring in. So this feedback is very critical. In the meantime, uh, Rishish, you can continue. Yes. So thank you very much, uh, everybody, for joining us this morning for the session. Uh, thank you, Esther, Rajesh, and Harsh for always being there and and coming up with a superb uh, huddle. And I look forward to and I would like to thank the executive team at Ascent, uh, the events team, and the governing council, of course, for putting this together. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Rasesh. Uh, thank you. I must say that the questions were very, very good. I I really admired the questions. They are really, uh, I think, a lot of. Uh, a lot of thought has gone into asking the right questions, which is very heartening. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all and wish you all the best. Thank you, everyone.